Well, uh, in that case, good morning, everyone, and uh, of course, uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for uh, for putting together this nice workshop, and obviously for giving us the opportunity to present our work, which does indeed, you know, fittingly after an afternoon dish, be concerned that the relations between information theory, machine learning, and, and physics, in particular the, the uh, real space synchronization group. And, and before I really begin, uh, let me acknowledge my, my collaborators, particularly so Zohar Ringel from, from the Hebrew University of, of Jerusalem, who's the co-author on, on the paper we, we published on this subject earlier uh, uh, this year, as, as well as uh, Sebastian Huber, he's the head of the group at the ETH where I'm a postdoc, and Patrick Legenhager, he's a, he's a bachelor student, but an extremely talented one. And together with, with Zohar, uh, uh, we've, we've worked on, on the second work, which, which we're very excited about, and we've put it up on the uh, archive just a week and a half ago. So I'll try to tell you also a little bit uh, about this. Okay, so the outline of the talk is as follows. I'll, I'll give you literally a few sentences about this relation between machine learning and in, in, in condensed matter physics before jumping into the main part, which, which concerns our sort of information theoretic approach to real space RG. I'll describe a, a certain machine learning algorithm, which is inspired by this, and I'll show some results, which are both numerical and um, analytical. So normally at this point I would have a few slides which would you know, describe the, all the creative ways in which people have applied machine learning to problems in condensed matter physics, but because the time is short and, and because actually some of the people responsible for those developments are, are in the audience and you will have the chance to hear them uh, in, in first person, uh, let me just you know make one little remark, which actually comes back to what Lenka said already, is that currently the, the, you know the, the relation between machine learning and condensed matter or statistical physics is, is sort of mutually beneficial. But Naftali Tishbi has very nicely uh, told us about you know 30 years uh, of, of development on the side of statistical physics, how that has informed our understanding of, of the learning process. Uh, but, but conversely, you know, in the last three maybe years, there's been many development on the side of on, on the side of uh, a condensed matter, where methods which were which were originally um, developed in in the context of machine learning are applied to the problems in physics. So there's sort of a nice feedback loop now in in in, in which perhaps you know some theoretical developments in physics inspire methods in machine learning and then come back to to physics again. So with that, I, I'll finish you know all the introduction and. Let me go to the main part of the talk. So, you know, if some of you are missing the coffee and, and, and feeling like they uh, need to zone out already, so here's sort of one slight punchline. So, so what we have is a, is a formulation of real space RG in terms of information theory, and inspired by this theoretical picture, we have a, we have a machine learning algorithm, unsupervised machine learning algorithm for classical statistical physical systems, which is supposed to help you to extract what are the sort of relevant low energy or, or la large wavelengths degrees of freedom in that system. And using that, you can try to reconstruct the uh, RG flow of the system or you know, try to compute the, the critical exponents. Uh, and, and we also have some sort of analytical understanding why, why this makes sense. Um, all right, so the RG. I know the audience is, is, uh, is you know, physicist, but uh, le let me give you a one slide introduction to this. So, you know, RG, stems from, from a, a very simple, but nevertheless a very profound uh, observation that a physical system which is, which is probed or, or observed at, the, at a different energy scale, a different uh, length scale, uh, looks different. Uh, nevertheless, it is, still the same, you know, it is still the same system, therefore there should be some sort of conceptual relation between the effective descriptions of that system at, at various length scales. So, so this connection between, let's say, Hamiltonian descriptions of the system at various length scales is, is formalized in, in the notion of RG flow. So what's, what's pictured here is, is some you know, caricature RG flow of a fictitious uh, uh, system. And what I guess, what I, what I wanted to impress upon you and what I guess you actually you know, know very well is that generic features of, of um, such RG flows have physical significance. So for instance, you know, fixed points of RG flows correspond to a stable phase of matter if they're stable or uh, critical systems, phase transitions if they're unstable. Directions in the RG flow around uh, critical points define what are the sort of relevant irrelevant operators and so forth. So, essentially, what RG is doing is it provides a, a theoretical formal underpinning for the notion of universality in condensed matter physics. And then, of, that's of course of paramount importance because you know, with that, without that, we wouldn't be able to talk about properties of something so as simple as, as say, a, a ferromagnet. Uh, but we would have to start describing every single instance of a, of a ferromagnet differing by few impurities anew. And of course, what's also important to uh, uh, remark is that you know, there isn't really a single RG. 
right? It's 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 not a particular theory. It's 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 more of a framework. And you know, many kinds exist. There's the momentum shell, Wilsonian RG. There is the the, the real space RG that, that we like to think about. But there are also things in in uh, you know entanglement space. But they all share this one underlying uh, philosophy behind them, which is that it's an iterative procedure where you know you divide the, the degrees of freedom into into two kinds let's say the slow and the fast one that's that's just a that's just a name that I that I give them at the moment you you integrate you know one of those sets and you construct the the effective theory in terms of the others and and you sort of methodically inter iterate this procedure until until finally you arrive at this large wavelength or, or low energy effective theory that describes the interesting properties of your system okay uh, so in that sense some form of relation of, of RG to uh, information theory is obvious because this averaging procedure is a form of a lossy compression where irrelevant microscopic details of the system are, are discarded and uh, the information that is preserved along the flow is, is the one that ultimately characterizes the, the fixed point. Okay? The question though of course is whether this intuition can somehow be uh, you know, nicely formalized and, and whether it can be useful in practice for, for anything. So, so let us now be a little bit more uh, concrete and let's, let's focus on, on uh, the real space RG. So uh, real space RG proceeds by uh, dividing the system into uh, spatial blocks and constructing uh, some sort of coarse-grained description of each block in terms of new, the new, new variables and deriving an effective theory uh, in their terms. So what's, what's, pictured, what's pictured here is, uh, is you know, some, some fictitious system we, we describe the system by, by uh, a probability distribution x. It's, it's given to us by some Hamiltonian. Forget for the moment about the, you know, the details of this picture. This whole thing is the system x. There is a block v which is being coarse-grained into a smaller set of variables h. So we, um, we formalize this, this notion of, of coarse-graining as a, as a conditional probability distribution which describes how the new degrees of freedom h depend on the you know, original underlying degrees of freedom v. Okay, so if you do so, then the probability that describes the distribution of the degree, degrees of freedom after the coarse grading is obtained very simply. You just take the, the old one, you, you, you multiply it by the conditional probability, you trace out the, uh, the original ones, and that implicitly defines the, the, you know, the Hamiltonian of the new system. Uh, but of course the question you know, is uh, wh whether the choice of the coarse grading procedure matters, and a simple way to convince yourself that, that it does is to think of some silly an extreme example in which your course grading procedure actually doesn't depend at all on the original system and in fact it just signs some random value to, uh, uh, you know, to, to the new uh, variable. Okay? So it's clear that after one step of such RG procedure uh, you know, the, the new system has actually nothing to do with, with the original one and, and clearly doesn't describe any low uh, energy or large wavelength physics of the original one. Okay? But even if you don't do anything as, as silly as that, even, even if you don't do something as extreme, you still might run into trouble. And that is because the effective Hamiltonian that you obtain after the course training might be actually a complicated beast. It, it may actually contain uh, many body or, or, or long, large weight, sort of uh, long range interactions, even if the original Hamiltonian did not. Okay, so of course then the question is, so how to choose this course training procedure such, uh, uh, such that this don't happen? such that you somehow obtain a very nice description of, of your system after the course grain. So, so what we postulate is that if ultimately you're uh, interested in, in the theory which, which describes the you know, long wavelength properties of your system, then the degrees of freedom in the block that's being course grained that you should keep track of are the ones that actually know something about the you know, long wavelength properties of the system, meaning the ones that somehow fluctuate, the, if you think of a spin, the spins that somehow fluctuate with the spins far away in the system, as opposed to the ones which describe short, short length scale fluctuations within the block. So in other words, we would want to keep those degrees of freedom which carry the most information about the remainder of uh, the system. And to, uh, to do that, we, we introduce uh, 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 the following construction. We, we think of a, of a block as having some sort of linear extent, linear scale, let's call it L, and we introduce this, this notion of a buffer which, which surrounds the block. It's, it has a thickness of, of L2. It's, it's basically the length scale in, uh, in this system. And we denote everything beyond this buffer as the environment of the block E. And now what we postulate is that your, your course learning procedure uh, you know the way you choose your 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 new degrees of freedom. The parameters which 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 define that 
should be chosen in such a way so, so that the new degrees of freedom retain the most information about the environment of the block. And formally, we say uh, that we want to, uh, uh, we, we want to choose the, the parameters defining this, this conditional probability distribution. And I didn't tell you yet how we parameterize that conditional distribution, but there are some parameters. We want to choose them in such a way that we maximize this quantity, the mutual information between the new degrees of freedom and the environment of the block. Not with the block itself, but with its environment. So, let me now explain some of the terms that I, that I use. So, I, I want to kind of transmit you know, the, the, this algorithm in, in slight more detail. So, the mutual information is, I suppose many, many of you know it, but, but you know, for, for those who don't, it's a very simple uh, quantity for two random variables. It just tells you literally how many bits of information about one random variable do I learn if I know the other. Now, if two random variables are, are you know, uh, completely statistically independent, then clearly there's nothing that I can learn about you know, one if I know the other. And in that case, the mutual information is equal to zero. Uh, if, if on the other extreme, for example, one random variable is an exact copy of the other random variable, well, the, all I can learn is, is the full entropy of that random variable. So, so it's sort of a bounded quantity. Uh, and it really, you know, it really measures all the information that is shared between those variables. That means it measures the correlations to all orders. Of course, you know, there, is, there is a formula. It's, it's basically uh, uh, you know, an average over the joint distribution of, of, of those two random variables of this logarithm of a ratio of the uh, uh, joint distribution to the product. So for, for those of you who uh, you know, fool around more with some machine learning, you, you see that this is essentially the, the so-called coolback Leibler divergence between two very particular distributions, the joint and the product. So in some sense, mutual information tells you how far away the real joint distribution of those two random variables is from being a, a, a factorizable distribution. You can also compute it in a different way. You can, you can see I mean, it comes from the same formula. You know, it quantifies this is our lack of knowledge about, let's say, variable h. And this is our lack of knowledge about the variable h after we already know e. So that's exactly how much we've learned from knowing e. OK. So that's, what, so that's the function that, that we would want to maximize. And how are we going to maximize this? So for that, we use this particular uh, 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 machine learning tool, which are, which are the Boltzmann machines. Of course, one could come up with, with, with a different uh, uh, optimization technique and a different machine learning tool, but that's the one that, uh, that we use because uh, it, it has very nice properties. It works for us uh, computationally, and analytically, it's, it's a very simple thing. So what are those Boltzmann machines? So you know, they're sort of stochastic networks whose main, main strength is that they uh, model very well probability distributions. Okay? So again, uh, one slight introduction to, to Boltzmann machine. Think of a collection of, of binary uh, classical easing variables, so let's say classical spins. Uh, and they are divided into two sets. One of them, which are sort of customarily called the visibles, is synonymous with your input data. The other one is an auxiliary set that you call the hiddens. And there is a, a very simple uh, uh, energy function so it contains a, a quadratic interaction between the set of uh, visibles and the hiddens and on-site magnetic fields. And the peculiarity of this restricted uh, uh, Boltzmann machine model is that it does not contain interactions within the set of visibles or within the set of hiddens. And that little detail turns out to be quite important uh, in, in practice for, for applications. So this energy function, by a, by a simple Boltzmann weight, it it's defines a, a parameter-dependent probability distribution, joint probability distribution on the space of visibles and the hiddens. And the parameters of, of the distributions are, of course, the magnetic fields and those interaction energies. And this object, in turn, you know, gives rise to some, some descendants, such as uh, uh, you know, the marginal or, or a conditional probability distribution that you can define. So now imagine that you're given a set of samples, which are drawn from some unknown probability distribution. And your task, then, is Maybe I yes. Now I feel like a, a pop star. Yeah. So um, so so imagine now that you're given a set of samples from some you know probability distribution that you don't know, and your task then is to choose the parameters of this, which we let's say collectively label as as theta, in, in such a way that the probability distribution defined by the by, by that object is as close as possible to the original one, which generated your data samples. Now, if you can achieve this, then, 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 then you will actually have gained two things. So on, on, on one hand, you will have an analytical uh, ansatz for your probability distribution, which may be useful in its own right. 
but uh, also the, this probability distribution can then be efficiently sampled. So you can generate new samples from that probability distribution, and that's, that's the particular strength of the restricted Bolson machines. And then, of course, the question comes down to uh, you know, how to choose uh, those parameters. And you know, I also had a, a slide on that, but I guess I'll just leave you with, with, with this one sentence uh, uh, statement that, you know, there is, that there is this uh, canonical uh, uh, algorithm which is called contrastive divergence. It's essentially, uh, it, it's related to, to uh, maximal likelihood learning. And it's something which uh, uh, practically works extremely well. It's an algorithm due to, uh, to Hinton. And normally, uh, Bolton machines are trained this way. That's, at least it works, okay? But let's, let's not go into, into details. That's, that's not important. So, so let's describe maybe in, in, in slightly more details uh, what we do in practice in, in our algorithm. So, so we, start with, we start with a set of probability you know, samples from the probability distribution that, that's describing our physical system, whatever, whatever that is. And we begin by training two RBM machines. Uh, this is basically a, a certain analytical ansatz for us. Uh, one of them is to to model the probability distribution of the degrees of freedom in the block being constrained, and the other one is, is to, to give us a handle on the joint probability distribution of the block and the environment, and those things are trained with, with this uh, standard contrastive uh, divergence algorithm. Those trained RBMs become the input for, for the main stage of the algorithm, where we, uh, we produce an ansatz for this coarse graining probability distribution. This ansatz also has a form of an RBM, but it is not trained as an RBM. It is not trained with contrastive divergence. There is a, there is a sort of special separate uh, optimization procedure which tries to maximize, to fix the parameters of that guy in such a way as to maximize this mutual information between, between the new variable it defines and the environment. So there is a, a loop which is also being computed with, with gradient descent method to, to try to you know, maximize that, that function. And this is the, the you know this is the really the heart of the algorithm, and this is also the costly part because computing uh, uh, some approximation of this quantity involves running a, a little short chain uh, sort of Monte Carlo inside. Okay. Yeah. So uh, da, da, da. yes. So V is always uh, you know the the, vi the visibles whatever that's the block being coarse grained. H are the new hidden are, are the new uh, compressed variables. E is the environment of the block. So I always try to coarse grain V to, to H, but what defines how I coarse grain is the environment. Um, all right. So I will not, well, you know, because I actually don't have time, I, I will not give you uh, the, the more details of, of the algorithm. You can, of course, find it you know, all, all in the paper, or you know, if you're so inclined, you can ask me. Uh, but what I'll try to do is I'll, I'll try to show you uh, some, some results that, that we obtain using this, both, both uh, numerical and, and analytical. So obviously, you know, once, once you claim that you're doing some sort of real space RG, the first thing you, you'd want to try it on is, is probably 2D easing model, okay? So here's a 2D easing model. There should be some sort of coupling constants, ferromagnetic. So, so normally, you know, real space RG of, of, uh, of 2D easing model, that goes by the, the so-called Mignal, you know, Kadanov, Procedure, which is you know numerically, what what you can do is you divide the system into little blocks of, of uh, two by two, and uh, you you try to construct one effective spin that describes each of the blocks. And and the way you do it is you know you use a, a, a democracy, no no gerrymandering whatsoever. If two of the spins point up, then the you know the block uh, is assigned a spin up. If two of the spin spin point down, then it's spin down. And if if it's a tie, then you throw a coin. Okay. So this procedure works, you know, works well in practice, and you can, if you do so, you know, there is this numerical uh, you know, Monte Carlo renormalization group, uh, you know, techniques which are which are there from from the 80s, and and you'll recover your uh, you know flow of of the of the two the model. So what we do is we we just generate the configurations of that system and we throw it at the algorithm and we we try to perform the procedure. So again, think in terms of this picture. So you have, you have the block V that is being coarse grained, but the block V now is two by two, and there's only a single hidden degree H. And what's being pictured are the four weights, which, which describe how the hidden couples to the visibles, or in other words, how the hidden depends on, on the visibles. 
So that's pictured here. Now that's a very unimpressive looking blue square, but what it, what it tells you is that the hidden couples roughly in an equal way to all the visibles in the block. That's, that's the result of, of, of the algorithm. So it tells you that the hidden degrees of freedom depends in essence on the average magnetization of the block. In other words, it essentially recovers this majority uh, rule uh, that, I, that I just described you, but I didn't put it by hand, that's, that's what it learned, okay? Now, what, what you can also do, of course, you, you can try some, some trivial sanity checks, like you can ask, for instance, what happened if I try to produce a compressed description you know, of, of, of my system where I actually don't really compress anything at all. I, I give it enough degrees of freedom to keep track of everything, and okay, that's a sanity check, it doesn't do anything crazy, it actually keeps track of the spins that we uh, had before. So what you could, you know, what, what you could do if you already, you know, went through the pain of, of doing this for, for, for the easing model, what, what can you do with that? Well, you know, if you, if you have a coarse painting procedure, you can actually try to coarse paint the system and, and you can try to extract some physical quantities with that. So what we can do is, is we can generate, of course, this, the, 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 the samples of the system at various temperatures, which we conveniently chose, you know, uh, uh, around the critical point. You can learn somehow the coarse graining rule. You can perform the coarse graining, and then you can iterate. You can learn again. You can perform the coarse graining, and if if you have a way to somehow intrinsically estimate what is the temperature of your system after the coarse graining step, so you know the temperature at the very outset because you've generated the samples. But if you if you have a way to intrinsically define the temperature after the coarse graining, then then you can recover some uh, some uh, RG flow of the system. Just so, so the, the lines are just for the you know, eye-guiding purposes. What really matters are, are the points at the, at the integer values. Those are sort of you know, one, two, three, whatever are uh, RG steps. And you know, what you see is, is that you recover the, the, the correct picture. So, so if the samples were, were, were generated uh, uh, below the, the critical temperature, then every single you know, subsequent RG step reduces your temperature and you ultimately flow to a, a ferromagnet. If, if you start above, then you flow to a paramagnet. Uh, and you know what, what I wanted, to, of course, to impress upon you is that, in, in some sense, you know, you understand everything about two D easing models, so there is there is no surprise. But you didn't have to understand two D easing models. So if if you looked at this picture and you didn't know it was a two D easing model, you would still immediately understand that this thing seems to have an unstable fixed point and essentially two uh, stable phases. And you could fairly well estimate where 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 the position of this of this you know critical point is, and also you know. Numerically, if, if you get where it is, you can also try to measure, you, you know that you're increasing your, your length scale after every uh, RG step, so you can also try, by, by scaling relation, to, to estimate what is the critical exponent. So this, this can be done. Um, and, and yes, we have, uh, we have done it. Um, but of course, you know, easing model is, 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 is a somewhat uh, uh, simple uh, story. So we wanted to try it also on, on, on something else. So uh, for that we, we, we chose this, uh, this dimer model. So, so it's a model which, you know, it's convenient because it can be mapped into the same sort of input format, but, but it has a sort of much more uh, uh, interesting uh, physics. So it's, it's defined by a, by a set of local constraints. So this model is basically, it's a statistical physical model. So those are basically just coverings of a square lattice. And there is a set of local rules. It says one and only one covered dimer at every vertex. And the partition function of that model is basically just, just counting all the valid configurations of the dimer. So that model looks sort of deceptively simple, but actually it has some sort of long-range physics. And the way you, you can see it, so the normal way to, to, to understand what is the physics of, of that model is you, you go to a you know, book of Rutkin, field theory of condensed matter physics, yes, and you, know, you, you do a set of mathematical mappings. So first you start with the, with the dimer model, you map it into some height model which lives on the plaquettes, then you realize that what you really should be looking at are the gradients of this, of this height field, then you take a continuum limit, and then you realize that, oh, actually, my, my theory is described by effective electrical field, which is actually conserved. It, it, obeys, it obeys Gauss's law. And then you say, well, if I wanted to course train that, then I would look at low, you know, like constant electrical fields, let's say in x and y directions, low k components of the electrical field. And then you would try to map it back to the dimers. How does it look in terms of the dimers? And you would realize that, in terms of the dimers, you would be really interested in looking at such staggered dimer patterns, sort of staggered patterns in either x or y direction, as opposed to, let's say, such columnar ones, okay? So now, if you couldn't really follow exactly the details of that, it's, it's because you weren't really meant to, because, uh, you know, what you could do is you could actually just generate the samples 
the samples of that model, and, and you could try to feed it into algorithm and, and see what it tells you you should be uh, uh, minding. So we do that, but we, we try to even complicate it just a little bit. You know, RG should be uh, somehow agnostic to, to all the little microscopic details that you add to your system, like all the, all the noise. So, so that's what we do. So that's the model that I had before, the, the dimers. But we add additional spin degrees of freedom to it, to sort of corrupt it. So the spin degrees of freedom live on the uh, sites and uh, on the plaquettes. And the only thing we do is we sort of ferromagnetic couple, ferromagnetically couple each diagonal pairs of spins. Uh, but the pairs of spins are decoupled from the dimers, and they're decoupled from each other. So, so this is totally short-scale noise, which doesn't you know, influence the physics of the dimers at all. Okay? And configurations of this stuff we feed into the, the algorithm. Uh, and, and that's what you get. So again, what's pictured is, is a block. You know, the, the block is uh, here 8 by 8. And what you see is the, the, the pattern of the couplings of this hidden unit to the spins in the block. And what you realize is that, you know, wherever there was a position of spin, the network puts zero value, so it just completely discards information about the spin noise in the first step. And the sort of configurations it wants to uh, keep track of are exactly the stagnant pattern. So basically, this guy keeps track of something like an EX, and this guy keeps track of something like an EX plus, plus EY. Okay? So uh, I will tell you a little bit more, but because time is short, let me just describe you in, in you know, few sentences the, the, the results that we had in, 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 in the paper that, that we recently put out on the RACAF. So, you know, the way I, 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 I told this to you, it, it was, you know, I would say, you know, motivated, but there wasn't, you know, really a particularly good analytical or theoretical reason why, why this should work. Okay, you know, it should take, it, it should somehow measure information about the remainder of the system. But why, why does it really work? So the message of, the, of that paper is, is the following. Uh, if you produce an uh, RG sort of course graining procedure, which, which optimizes this, this mutual information, then your effective Hamiltonian will be as simple as, as it can be. So basically the message is, if you choose the good degrees of freedom in whose term to think you know, about the system, then your description of the system in, as, as an effective Hamiltonian will also be simple. So we have a, 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 a number of, of, uh, of statements which are sort of you know, both of general nature and also some exactly solvable models. And, and the first one is, is something like this. That, that's a, um, it, in some sense, it's, it's, it's a very strong assumption, but if you think of this, of this again, this, it's, it's, a, it's a 1D cut of, this, of the same picture that we had before. So there is block V being coarse gradient into variable H, and there's the environment and so forth. So the block V carries some information about the environment. It intrinsically always has, because you know, it's, it's, it's a part of the system. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to keep as much as possible but, of course, you cannot keep more than there is. So there is always an, this inequality. The, the amount of information that you can retain is always less or equal to the full information contained in the block. If you're somehow able to, to, to make that into an equality, then, then the follow so it's, a, it's an extremely strong assumption, then, uh, then the following hold true, then the, the distribution of, of, the, uh, of the spins in the environment factorizes, which means if you actually start with a short-range Hamiltonian, the range of your effective Hamiltonian will not increase after the coarse grading. Uh, and uh, because it's a very strong assumption, we, we also uh, try to uh, uh, show how it works you know, when, when, when you are not allowed to have one like this. And for that, we, uh, uh, we solved exactly the case of the easing model, where for a generic coarse grading procedure, we did two things. So, we computed for, for any pattern of the couplings into the block, we computed what is the effective Hamiltonian that you get, and we computed how much mutual information you retain. So what's pictured here is the strengths of those couplings, lambda 1 and lambda 2, of the single hidden to two degrees of freedom in the block. And what's on the scale is the mutual information. What you see is that you retain max when... OK, I'm finished. Basically, the statement is... Uh, your effective Hamiltonian kills off all the longer range or and higher order coefficients. So that's basically the message of the paper, and you know there is much more, and I invite you to have a look at it. And let me finish by uh, well, I wanted to show you some of the other things that we work on. If if you're you know feel so inclined to uh, chat about us, they, they concern both applications of machine learning to physics and physics to machine learning with, you know, collaborators in other places. And, uh, you know, I'll leave you with uh, 
the conclusions. Thank you very much.